God is sovereign over these things. And so, you know, but hopefully these people will see that. Hopefully they will understand these prayers. And here's one thing about prayer. Seeing how you brought that up. This is the same issue, but from healing, okay? The thing that we can do to damage a person's faith as much as anything and I bring this up because one of we have one other guy that goes with us, and he's from a much more charismatic church. And we will pray for people. Lord, you know, if it's your will, please heal this person. If not, please help them to understand why you haven't. We have one person that doesn't do that. He goes misquoting the Bible, and by Jesus' stripes you are healed. And, you know, he quotes the Old Testament, Isaiah, and he takes it out of context. Anyway, that's spiritual healing. It's not physical healing that's being cited there. But he quotes these things and he says, In Jesus' name, I demand that this uh, be healed. And we know that you're going to do this according to uh, your promises and your word. And he's misquoting all of these scriptures, claiming something. And what is that going to do when this person may not get healed? It's going to harm their faith. They're going to say, this Jesus is an ineffective God. When in fact, this person was supposed to learn from the affliction. He's got the affliction for a reason. Like I said, my back hurts. Maybe it's to keep me from climbing up a tree and hurting myself more or whatever, you know? But we cannot, the, the, the most damaging thing that we can do is claim anything in Jesus' name. One, it damages our relationship with God, and it also damages the peoples around us, their perceptions when it doesn't happen. So, you know, claiming something from a sovereign God is not a good thing to do. You haven't lost your salvation in the process, but you sure can lose your joy. So keep that in mind, is that when we pray, we should ask and not claim. Okay? I, I, you do what you want with your prayers, but I just think that's always better, is to ask humbly. You know? And then once again, what does it say in Hebrews? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Does that mean that when we get there, we demand something? No. It means that we have access to the throne of grace, not a priority at the throne of grace. Okay? So please keep those things in mind. Don't mean to keep getting diverted, but these are really important issues, and this is all kind of tied up in what the Israelites lack of faith. So I think we're in 15, and we've got plenty of time. Go ahead, 15-1. Can we have a new reader? I, I... Oh, okay. Who wants to read? Anybody? Oh, Roy's got it. 15-1. <laughs> Is it uh, then? Oh. 15-1. <coughs> I got it now. <laughs> I didn't have it before. There you go. <clears throat> Then sang Moses and the children of Israel that uh, this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Wonderful. Just, you can just hear, the, as you're reading this, just think about the, 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 the joy of these people at being vindicated in the end. It being vindicated, they've been wrong, and now they're being vindicated, and they're thanking the Lord for what they had lacked faith in. And that is, as Gene said, that's what we should do. Instead of just forgetting about a deed, thanking the Lord. And boy, it's, it, it, this goes on for another 17 verses. Go ahead, Roy. The Lord is my strength and song. And he is become my salvation. Once again, the word there. Salvation is Yeshua. It's a form of, I think, Yeshua, ta, whatever. Anyway, the Lord, Jehovah is my strength and he is my song. He has become my Jesus. The Lord, Jehovah, has become my Jesus. So even in the Old Testament passage, it is pointing forward to something. They had no idea that this is what they were saying. But in the end, Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. And this is prefiguring that right here in this particular passage. He is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Man, what words. Oh, go ahead. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. Mm. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Okay, now, once again, the Lord is a man of war. 
Okay, Revelation 19, it says Jesus is going to come back and he is going to destroy the nations. That does not mean that the Lord wants to have war. People make category mistakes in their theology about Jesus when they say, well, how could he, you know, this is the Sermon on the Mountain, love your neighbors and all these kind of things. He is preparing us for the kingdom age when there is not rebellion against God. But in the meantime, there are people that are rebelling against God who have been given a choice throughout life, individually and collectively, we are given choices. And when God sees no, uh, what's the term? He sees no, uh, it says it right there in the book of uh, Kings. He's, uh, there's, in other words, there's no resolution to the problem. What does he do? He exiles his people. The people that he has called he exiles them because they won't listen. And then when the people come against his people, he destroys them because of his own sovereign purposes. He does, I don't think God in any way at all relishes in war. That's against his very nature. But he is a God of justice and he is a God of righteousness. And therefore he must execute justice or he is not the God that we are describing. And so he is a man of war when he needs to be. He is a God of compassion when he is able to be. Okay? All right. Darrow's chariots and his host have been cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Okay, one more time. I want to talk about what we talked about last week. In case, remember last week I talked about uh, here's Egypt and here's the Red Sea down here. They get into the Sinai and they're to cross the Red Sea. Well, some people say, Jay's footnote read this in the NIV, I think it was, that instead of the Red Sea, it says Yam Suf in Hebrew, and Suf means reeds, okay? So some people say it wasn't the Red Sea at all that they crossed over. Actually, it was this little lake that they crossed over, and then they went on from there, okay? And this lake is like knee deep, okay? And so you get, it's the Sea of Reeds. The reeds are only this tall, so you're, you can wade through it. And so God just, you know, he moved the water out of the way, and it was dry for him. And what does it say there? It says that these people were drowned in the depths of the sea, so what is more foolish to believe? That these people crossed through the Sea of Reeds on dry ground and then, or is it, uh, I'm sorry, it's more foolish to believe that they went through the Red Sea with a wall on either side which is very, very deep coming out of a chasm. Is that more believable or is it more believable that the entire Egyptian army drowned in knee-deep water? Which is it? Right? And so we need to keep that in context because Yam Suf, the word Suf can mean end, as in the end of the land of Israel, or it can mean read. Okay? Which is it? And certainly the New Testament tells us because the New Testament is in a different language. And that language is Greek and it says the Red Sea. So we don't need to listen to these scholars that diminish the Word of God. The Word of God stands. If they would simply turn to the New Testament, they would be able to see that. But they don't. They want to say that an uh, entire army of Egyptians drowned in knee-deep water in a sea of reeds. Okay, and So that verse right there once again confirms it. And we're going to see this again and again. But I just wanted people to remember that that is one of the debates that modern critical scholars like to bring up is it sea of reeds you know it's not the sea of reeds it's the red sea okay go ahead thy right hand o lord is become glorious in power mm. thy right hand o lord hath dashed in pieces the enemy and in the greatness of thine excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee where you go right there that shows you god his vindication. These people have rose up against you. God would not arbitrarily go destroying people. He's not a vindictive God. He's, and I want to make a distinction here because the God of Islam is a vindictive God. If you've ever read the Quran, if people tell you, well, the God of the Quran is the same as the God of the Bible, etc., they have never read the Quran. They have never studied what that book says because I read it before I went to Malaysia. I live in a Muslim country. And he is a, a vindictive God. He is a changing God. And as I said, we can know without ever 
knowing the Bible, we can know that God does not change. He cannot change if he is the creator. Lil, have a wonderful week. Bless you now, okay? So, right there, he is specifically saying, and these are the people acknowledging this to God, they rose up against you. If I decide next week, my wife and children and my dogs and everybody gets killed, my house burns down, and I just decide to flip out and say, I hate God, right? And I shake my puny little fist at him. He is totally just in destroying me. He is totally just in whatever happens to me because I have lacked the faith that I should have had to say that you, you created me in the first place. You are the potter, I am the clay, you mold me as I wish, right? And that is what these people have done. They have rose up against God. And if I do that, then I deserve exactly the same thing. That's just the way it is. And I know that's hard sometimes to look at. But when you look at it from his perspective, he created us. All he asks is for worship because he is infinitely worthy of our praise. And we don't give it to him. And he, he is righteous when he speaks. Oh, and I love the terminology, especially you're reading what, the King James Version? Uh, whatever it is, it's beautiful. It's very close to what I'm reading, so I think it's probably the King James Version. Mine is the New King James. It's got a little less hath and thou. But the excellency, you said something about the excellency of uh, uh, just wonderful words. Anyway, please, go ahead. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Man, beautiful, beautiful language. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead, in the mighty waters. So there you go. The, the whole Egyptian army sank in knee-deep water in the Sea of Reeds, right? No, that didn't happen. This, this was really the Red Sea, and God really delivered them by a miracle. If you hold to this as God's word, and I do. I, I have studied the other religions of the world. I've studied the nature of God, and I can tell you that nothing in this book, nothing contradicts what we can know apart from the Bible. And we can know these things. Oh, I can't wait for next week's sermon. I'm, and, you know, if you can't make it out to the beach, it'll be online. The guy, uh, the Jewish guy that comes out to these sermons posts them online. Unfortunately, the one we did two weeks ago, he forgot to turn on the, uh, the uh, microphone for the first 15 minutes, so he didn't put it on there, Yom Kippur. But the one last night he taped, and, you know, you, but next week, I tell you, I just, I, I love... I love to study these type of things apart from the Bible because they confirm the Bible. And God is, as I said, He has given us brains to think these things through. And our problem is, and this isn't saying that I'm smart. I want everybody to know that I'm going to say this in the sermon next week. I never, never thought about these issues, ever. Until I was forced to at Bible college, I'd never thought of any of these things. And all of a sudden, somebody says, look at this. This is something that somebody thousands of years ago, not even a part of the Bible, thought of these things. And I thought, uh, talk about a wonderful way to know that God is who he says he is, is by just looking at what he has revealed to us that we can simply think through apart from the Bible. And everybody should do that. But everybody doesn't do that. You see what I'm saying? And because we don't, it doesn't negate our culpability. Just like um, Adam, go back to the fall real quickly. Adam was told not to do th something. He did not have the knowledge of good and evil at the time. It does not negate his guilt. Charlie Garrett drives down Bee Ridge Road at 50 miles an hour. I didn't see the sign because the sign was before where I turned on. It doesn't negate my guilt. I'm still guilty even though there wasn't a sign. The law says I should know. God said, you should have known. We are guilty, whether we like it or not, in advance. And so, that's where we stand with this. Oh, I, oh, wonderful words. Go ahead, Roy. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonder? Okay, real quickly, that's a rhetorical question, and the answer comes back, no one.